Okay, let's bow in prayer. With our voices, Lord, we cry out. With our voice, we plead for mercy. We pour out our complaints to you. We tell you of our troubles. When our souls and spirits faint within us, you know our way. In the path where we walk, people have hidden a trap for us. Look to the right and see. There is no one who takes notice of us. No refuge remains for us. No one cares for our soul. Therefore, I cry to you, O Lord. I say you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Attend to our cry, for we are brought very low. Deliver us from our persecutors, for they are too strong for us. Bring us out of our prison, that we would give thanks to your name. The righteous will surround us, for you will deal bountifully with us. Father, we just ask that this prayer would be true to us this morning. That in our own sufferings, that in our own struggles, we would bring them to your feet and have you lift up our heads. Lord, I know that amongst us this morning there are those who bring with them uncountable and innumerable burdens. Burdens of the health, burdens of the heart. And just as we sang this morning, we ask that when we call out to you, you would answer us. And we praise you for this week, even as we were praying, Lord, you answered our prayers. And so, Lord, I pray and I ask that in the next few minutes, you would use my mind and my mouth to speak your word of encouragement and of truth and of joy to your people. Guard my mouth from error and from things that do not edify. And prepare and create in your people a heart this morning, able and willing to receive your word. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Praise God, we are in the, in the midst of our missions months. And in the last few weeks, we've been hearing from missionaries from all over the world and working for different peoples. Uh, but I want to remind you of how we got here. We spoke of the purpose of missions, which was worship. We said that missions exist because worship doesn't. And then we looked at the power of missions, the fuel that drives missions. And we saw that that was also worship. Worship is the fuel and the drive for missions. More specifically, it's actually prayer. Prayer is the fuel that burns and that ignites the hearts to send people on missions. It is the power of missions. And incidentally, on that note, I want to just say one thing that we have been talking a lot about prayer in our small groups um, and in, in, the, in the recent weeks. And I would just say you need to bring just like the Psalm 142 says, you bring your complaints and your troubles before the Lord and you see whether He answers them or not. In this past week, we have been praying desperately for God to work in this church. And He has. And I would just encourage you as a small groups and small group leaders to continue building prayer as one of the main ways you evangelize in the main ways you accomplish missions as a small group. We have a many, we have many opportunities for you to pray. Uh, Monday night prayer and worship nights are awesome. Every Monday we gather from six to eight and I just encourage you to come and see how God answers your prayer. But today we're not going to talk about prayer or worship. We're going to talk about the price of missions. The price of missions in one word is summarized by the word suffering or the word sacrifice. That's it. The price that people have paid and that Christians have paid for 2,000 years since Christ has come is summarized in the word suffering. And before we look at the passage today, I just want to read to you two stories of how this is true. There's a story of a 
indigenous, indigenous missionary who was walking barefoot from village to village preaching the gospel in India. His hardships were many. After a long day of many miles and much discouragement, he came to a certain village and he tried to speak the gospel, but he was driven out of the town and rejected. So he went to the edge of the village, dejected, and lay down under a tree and slept from exhaustion. When he awoke, people were hovering over him, and the whole town was gathered around him to hear him speak. And the head man of the village explained that they came to him, to look, look to him, to look at him while he was sleeping, because when he, they saw his blistered feet and his bleeding feet, they concluded that he must be a holy man and that they had been evil to reject him. They were sorry and they wanted to hear the message he was willing to suffer so much to bring to them. The suffering and the pain of that missionary was the means in which missions was accomplished. It was the price he paid for the village to be saved. Let me read to you another story of a Maasai warrior who worked in Africa. This story is written by Michael Card, but it's a, it's a, and a, it's a true account that he writes in Christianity Today. There's a Maasai warrior, his name was Joseph. He was walking along one of these hot, dirty African roads. And he met someone who shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with him. And there and then, he accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And the power of the Spirit began transforming his life. He was filled with such excitement and joy that the first thing he wanted to do was return to his own village and share the same good news with the members of his local tribe. Joseph began going from door to door, telling everyone he, everyone he met about the cross of Jesus and the salvation it offered, except, expecting to see in their faces the light of their, of their salvation. But to his amazement, the villagers not only didn't care, they became violent. The men of the village seized him and held him to the ground while women beat him with strands of barbed wire, and he was dragged from the village and left to die alone in the bush. Joseph somehow managed to crawl to a water hole, and there, after days of passing in and out of consciousness, he found the strength to get up. And he wondered about the hostile reception he received from his people. He decided that he must have left something out, or he must have told something incorrectly about Jesus. So after rehearsing the message of the gospel again, he decided to go back and share his faith once more. Joseph limped into the circle of the huts and began proclaiming Jesus, saying, He died for you so that you might find forgiveness and come to know the living God. Again, he was grabbed by the men of the village and while the women were beating him, the wounds on his body were reopened. Once more, they dragged him unconscious from the village and left him out to die. To have survived the first beating was truly remarkable. To live through the second was a miracle. Again, days later, Joseph awoke in the wilderness, bruised and scarred, and he, deter he was determined to go back to his people. He returned to the small village, and this time they attacked him before he had a chance to open his mouth. As, if, as they flogged him for the third time and probably the last time, he again spoke to them of Jesus Christ the Lord. And before he passed out, the last thing he saw was that the women who were beating him began to weep. This time when he awoke, he awoke in his own bed. The ones who had so severely beaten him were now trying to save his life and nurse him back to health. And the entire village had come to Christ because of his suffering. If you think that suffering 
is only for those who go on extreme overseas missions, then we have gotten it all wrong. Because God, since Jesus Christ, has always worked through the blood and the sacrifice and the suffering of his people to accomplish his missions. Let me read you from Matthew 10. This was the first missionary effort that Jesus sent. He was sending his 12 disciples out to Jerusalem and he said, Behold, I am sending you as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpent and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. Notice that Jesus knew that they would be as sheep sent into the wolves. Jesus knew that many of them would be flogged, many of them would be killed, and he said that they would be doing so, and God would allow this to happen so that they would bear witness before them of Jesus Christ. Suffering and sacrifice is not merely the consequence of missions it is the means by which Jesus accomplishes the missions. The, our suffering as Christians is not merely the result of our willingness to spread the missions. It is the means that God has chosen to glorify His name. And I just want to point you to one verse in the book of Colossians where we will see how this is true for Paul and how it is true for us. So turn with me now to Colossians chapter 1, verse 24. Colossians chapter 1, verse 24. Paul is writing this letter in prison. And he says this. Colossians chapter 1, verse 24. He says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. I'm going to read until verse 29. Of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me from, for you, to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations but now revealed to his saints, to them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. But I want to focus on verse 24 this morning because it just seems so absurd what Paul is saying here. He says, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. And this morning we need to ask, answer three questions about this. Number one, what is the purpose of suffering for Christians? What is the purpose of this suffering? that Paul is rejoicing in. And number two, what is our present day suffering and how can we suffer the way Paul is suffering here joyfully and gladly? Okay? So number one, why is suffering necessary for Christians? And here Paul says, he says, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body. The church. The reason he says Christians suffer is so that we would be able to fill up the suffering that is lacking in Christ. Think about that for a second. Paul is saying that when Christ suffered and he died on the cross, it was incomplete. There was something that was lacking in Christ's death. What was lacking? Well, we know that it, it, isn't, it isn't that he, his atonement for sin was lacking. 
No one can replace, no one can add to what Christ has done on the cross to take away the sins of the world. And Paul knows this. He wrote most of the New Testament speaking of the atonement of Christ. So when Christ died on the cross, he paid fully for the penalty of sin. Yes, so in that sense it is complete. But what does he mean here when he says that there is something that is lacking in Christ's affliction? And what he means is this. There are those who still do not know the suffering of Christ in this day and age. And they cannot see the suffering that Christ went through because Christ is now in heaven with his body and flesh. He is not here. He is not living and standing among us so that he can show us his wounds and his scars. So most of the world does not know of Christ's afflictions. They do not see his scars and they do not see the price he has paid. And Paul says here that he, as the apostle in the blood and the flesh, he is filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction, meaning that because Christ is no longer amongst the Colossians, he, they cannot see his sufferings, but they can see Paul's sufferings. They can see Paul's swollen back. They can see Paul's chains. And they can see his sacrifice for them. And in that, Christ's afflictions and his suffering is made to be complete. That's what he means by filling up the suffering of Christ. This tells us something about suffering. This means that suffering for a Christian is not merely a consequence or result of living for Jesus. It is the actual means by which people see your suffering and then glorify Jesus. Your suffering and your sacrifice for these people is actually the way they come to Christ. They cannot see Jesus. They cannot see His scars. But they can see you. And they can see your scars. And they can see your sacrifice. And in that, you fill up the suffering that is missing. The suffering that is lacking in Christ's body. When we speak of jars of clay and the treasures that is placed in jars of clay, primarily what we are talking about is a jar that is broken, that seems totally unsignificant, but inside of them there is a treasure that shines so brightly forth that through the cracks of these jars, the world sees and the world gives glory to God. Your cracks, your pain, your brokenness is the means by which Christ will be glorified. It is not just the result of sin and it is not just the result of your rebellion and it is not just the result of your suffering and persecution from people. It is the means by which God will be glorified. Think about that for a second. We are broken people. Our sins have caused much pain in the world. It has caused much pain to the people around us. It has caused much pain for ourselves. And yet, Christ and God is saying throughout to us through this passage that your suffering will be the means by which He will be glorified. Because your brokenness is the way by which the treasure inside of you will shine forth through the cracks of the jar of clay. But how does that work? How is God glorified through our suffering? It just seems so absurd. Why does God do that? Is He sadistic? And for all questions like this, we need to begin right at the beginning and we need to turn our eyes to Christ. We need to see that God could have chosen any means He wanted to save the world. And what did He choose? He chose to send His own Son and to die on the cross. The most gruesome, the most painful, the most cruel way to die. And why did He do this? He did it so that we would glorify Him through the sufferings of Christ. But how does that work? 
How does a Christian in his suffering glorify God? And for that, we need to turn to another passage, which is the companion part, uh, passage of this today's text, which is found in Matthew 5. If you've been in the Bible studies with the Jeremiah or the university group, you'll know what I'm going to talk about. But I think it's so significant that we need to hear this again and again in our lives because we need to know how God glorifies himself through our pain. Matthew chapter 5. Jesus is speaking to his a crowd, some of whom are disciples, some of whom are there just because Jesus is causing an excitement amongst the people. And he says in Matthew chapter 5, he speaks of the Beatitudes, which I won't read today, but I want, to, I want you to focus in on verse 10 through verse 16. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 10, Jesus says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And listen carefully. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your God who is in heaven. Jesus says, happy are you when you are persecuted. Happy are you when people insult you and say all kinds of evil against you. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. And then he goes on to say that you are the salt and you are the light of the world. And I take those two passages to mean that the way that you influence the world by being salt and the way that you shed light on this world by being light is primarily by rejoicing in your sufferings. That is the primary way you are able to be salt and light in the world. That's what it means to be the salt and light in the world. It means to rejoice in your sufferings in such a way so that when the world sees you, they are confused and they don't know how you can still be happy in such suffering. That's what we call salty Christians. That's what we call bright Christians. I've been encouraging the university group to name their group the salty group or the salt fellowship. That's how God is glorified. You glorify God in your sufferings by your rejoicing in them, by your steadfast joy, by that unchangeable, unmovable peace inside of you that the world sees and they cannot understand and then they say, I want what you have because there's something inside of you that I need to be happy. So suffering is not just the result of missions, it is the means by which missions is accomplished and it is accomplished through Christians who rejoice and are glad in their sufferings. Notice what Paul says when we go back to Colossians chapter 1, verse 24, he says, he says, I rejoice in my sufferings. There is a joy in the journey to follow the cross and the path of the cross. It is a painful path. We should never deceive ourselves and we should never let anyone deceive us to thinking that the life of a Christian is a life of just pleasure and joy without any suffering. Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. So the life of Christ and the life of following Christ is a painful one, but it is a profoundly happy one. It is a happy one that is also a painful one. Christians, we want to be people who are simultaneously joyful and simultaneously sorrowful. 
It's not my idea. God calls us to be this kind of people. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 6, he says, We are always sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. This is not schizophrenic. This is what Christians are characterized by. By their constant sorrow and their constant joy. By their constant sacrifice and by their constant joy in that sacrifice. And when people see that, they see a bright Christian, a salty Christian. If we choose to avoid sacrifice, if we choose to avoid sufferings, we are choosing against happiness. We are choosing against joy because Jesus says rejoice and be glad or happy are those who are persecuted. People, Christians who just want a pleasure-filled, comfort-filled life are people who choose against the real joy that is in Christ. You want to be happy? Then give up your life for others. You want to be joyful and have a peace that is unshakable? Then give up your life and sacrifice your life for the sake of missions. The happiest people in the world are those who know the mystery of Christ and then they gladly give up their rights for others. Those are the happiest people in the world. We know this. Because the happiest person in the world was by far Jesus Christ. In Hebrews chapter 12, it says, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Jesus, he lived a life full of joy, but he was a man of sorrows, as Isaiah 53 tells us. And Jesus, in his infinite joy and in his infinite suffering, was the greatest Example of what it means to glorify God through our pain and our suffering. There's a Romanian pastor and mission leader. His name was Joseph Tson. And he said this. He said, Christ's cross and Christ's suffering was for propitiation. Propitiation means to appease the wrath of God. So Christ's cross was for propitiation. But our cross is for propagation. Christ suffered to accomplish salvation, and we suffer to spread salvation. That's what it means to fill up what is lacking in Christ. And that's the price that we need to pay for missions to be accomplished. But what is our suffering? Few of us sitting here will be like Paul, will be people who will be beaten with a rod and thrown into the sea or stoned with rocks. And few of us will be in prison for the sake of the gospel. Few of us will have our houses burned and our children killed and our families desecrated. So what is the suffering that we suffer? And what is the sacrifice that we need to sacrifice? And I think that actually in the North America, we face a kind of suffering and a sacrifice that so few of us, even myself, we are unwilling to go through. No wonder so many Christians are unhappy and unfulfilled. I think the greatest suffering that we are faced with is the suffering of humiliation, the suffering of embarrassment, the suffering of being labeled a Jesus freak. I remember growing up in school and not wanting to tell my friends about Christ because I was afraid. I was afraid people would label me a Jesus freak and that I would lose friends. I was afraid to stand up for the gospel amongst my friends and colleagues because I didn't want to, I don't want to risk the humiliation of being rejected. I didn't want to risk the embarrassment of people making fun of me for believing in this Bible. And because of my fear of humiliation and embarrassment, I had never stood up for the gospel in my high school days. I never did. And I look back and I just think of the joy that I gave up. The riches of a life with Christ that I could have had if only I had risked humili humiliation. Brothers and sisters, I think Satan... 
tempts the North American Christians with a temptation that is more devastating than stones and fire and imprisonment. So many of us, we might be willing to die for Jesus. We might be willing to go to Africa and be speared and die for Christ. But to be humiliated? We don't want that. To be losing our dignity with our colleagues? We don't want to risk that. To, to risk starting up an uncomfortable discussion with our colleagues because we know that they might be adverse to the, to the message of the gospel and to the message of God. We, we don't want to risk that. I remember I didn't. And there was no, and no, no wonder I lived a life, a Christian life, void of the joy that was promised by Jesus. For the Christians in North America, our greatest suffering and our greatest sacrifice is our dignity. Brothers and sisters, if we are willing to lay down our dignity for Christ, to lay down our reputation for Christ, to risk being labeled, whatever label people want to put over us, we will find the joy that Paul experienced. And we will be able to say, I rejoice even in my sufferings. One of the things that has come to my mind in the recent weeks is that one of the ways we glorify God in our sufferings is primarily through how we present ourselves to our brothers and sisters in the church. I mean this primarily even over against presenting ourselves to non-Christians. One of the things that we need to, we want to try to avoid as a church is to be a church where on the facade and on the surface, we're just happy and Christians who do well and who have great families and perfect marriages and, and wonderful kids and great jobs and no suffering and no pain and no struggles in our lives. If we go around thinking that that's the way we glorify God, then we've missed the life of the cross. Paul's example and Christ's example is that he presents himself with his scars, with his hands, with his feet that are nailed through by those nails. And that Paul presents his sufferings and his vulnerability and his brokenness to his people so that these people would see that it is not this person, that it is not Paul who is strong, it is the God that is behind him that is strong. And what I mean by presenting ourselves to each other in the church as vulnerable, I mean this, don't hide your brokenness. Don't hide your broken marriages. Don't hide the suffering and the rebelling of your children. Bring forth your brokenness and your suffering to the church so that when they see your brokenness and they lift you up in prayer, they may see God work mightily through you. And in that, they will be glorifying and praising God. If we live a life of living by facades and masks, we not only hinder our own lives, we hinder the mission of the gospel. The world needs to see not only your successes and your wealth and your prosperity, they need to see your brokenness and your pain and how in your pain you turn to a God who heals your wounds. Brothers and sisters, we often speak about living out a testimony of excellence at work and you know striving for excellence in our work and in our studies and in whatever we do. And yes, you should be doing all that you can to glorify God in your studies, yes. But you know what even makes God look even greater? Is that when you are fired from your work, when you find that you cannot have children because your body is not fit for it, when you find that your marriages are crumbling because of human sin, when you find that your children are addicted to drugs or that they are addicted to video games, when they see, when the world sees that suffering in your life, and then they see the way you respond to that suffering, by turning to a God who is able and willing to save, I think that is infinitely more glorious, infinitely more 
attractive. People, it's easy to live with facades and masks. But when we show the world our brokenness and we show them how we respond to it, they see and they know that we are authentic Christians and we seek and we worship an authentic and real God. One of the reasons why we are so keen on encouraging people to get into small groups is primarily so that you can find a place where you can be vulnerable and where people can share your burdens. We understand that not everyone can, can, can be uh, so open with their pain. And you need to find people who are suitable to hear you out and to keep your secrets. And so we've been trying with all our elders and deacons to build new groups so that you can find that. So come and speak to us if you want to be part of those small groups. It is for your happiness and it is for the sake of missions. So the primary way why we, by which we suffer in our present day is to be humiliated, is to be embarrassed, and then to open up our vulnerabilities for others to see how we respond to them. But I want to end with how we can possibly be so happy in our suffering. And for that, we need to go back to what Paul says. We don't need to turn to it. I'll just read it to you. When Paul was in prison, he was still able to rejoice because of what he said here. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 14, he says, I press on toward the goal to which God has called me for the prize of the upward call of God in Jesus Christ. Let me read it to you again. I press on toward the goal for the prize that is in Jesus Christ. Why is Paul able to be so joyful in his sufferings? Because he sees with the eyes of his heart and a brilliant and beautiful prize at the end of that suffering that is so magnificent that it overshadows his suffering. And you and I, we know this. We experience this. You know, people, they, they train for marathons and they put themselves through excruciating pain. They run 42 Ks and they throughout that run, they hit the wall and they vomit and they fall down. They crawl towards the finish line for what? For the prize. And that prize could be recognition. That prize could be a sense of accomplishment. That prize could be a gold medal. That prize could be whatever you want. But people are willing to suffer for prizes. Students who, stu who study studiously, who give up hours of their weekends and they put all their energy and their strength into study. Why do they do that? They do it for the prize that is coming. For a good job, for a steady income. Farmers, they do the same thing. They toil year in and year out without seeing much result day in and day out. Why do they do so? Because they know that at the end of their suffering, at the end of their sacrifice, there will be a crop that will grow, that will be worth all of their sufferings. And so, brothers and sisters, for us to rejoice in our pain, to, for, our, for, our willing, for us to be willing to give up our rights, to give up our time, to give up our money, we need to fix our eyes on the prize. And then we will able, be able to do so. Next week, we will spend a whole sermon on what the prize is. But I want to give you a hint before we go to next week's text. The prize is primarily consisting of two things. Number one, the prize is Christ. He is the prize. And the question we need to f ask ourselves this morning is, do we love Jesus enough to give up our money for people? Do we love Jesus enough to give up our time for the sake of missions? Do we love Jesus enough to risk humiliation with our friends? The second prize, prize is Christ's people. That seems interesting. 
when you go out into missions and you suffer and you die for people, part of the prize in heaven will be the people whom you have died for. Part of the prize will be the people who have been saved through your witness. They will be with you in, in heaven, sitting at the table and feasting with Christ in heaven. And that will be your prize. And those are the two things, your love of God and your love of man, that will drive you towards suffering and sacrifice for people. And if you this morning, you see that I, I just don't have any love for Jesus. I don't have that love for Jesus and much less his people that drives me to this kind of sacrifice. When I hear people sing the songs, I, I don't feel that praise bubbling up in my heart. And the thing that we need to realize is that no one, no person, no human could ever will that in you. Neither can you. And that the greatest thing that you can be praying this morning for yourselves is the prayer that Paul prayed for the Ephesian church. Saying that he, I pray that the eyes of your heart would be open and that you would be filled with a spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. The only way in which you will be enthralled and mesmerized by Jesus is if, if, if this morning you just cry out with, to God with all your being, saying, God, make yourself beautiful to me. Make yourself attractive to me. Let me just end on this one last note. When Jesus, he was hanging on the cross, by all accounts, he was hanging there, fully stripped of his clothing, in his nakedness, in his humiliation. And the Roman soldiers, they would take these crosses and they would put them on the highways and the byways of, of the cities so that the whole world will see just how ugly the cross and the crucifixion was. So picture in your mind now, Jesus Christ, bloodied, exhausted and hanging completely naked, humiliated for you and for me. What humiliation is too great for you and I? What sacrifice is too great for you and I? And the thing that we need to see is that Christ in that humiliation is Christ at his most beautiful state. Because it is that naked, hanging body that saved you and I. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we just ask one simple thing this morning. That you would make and create in us hearts that are mesmerized by Jesus Christ. Hearts that are enthralled with the beauty of the Lamb that was slain. And that we would gladly and willingly share and live a life of suffering for Christ. We pray this in your Son's precious name. Amen.